Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. Merry Christmas season, couple weeks away. Excited for it. Hey, uh, put on your calendars. Come on out for Christmas Eve services Saturday night and Sunday morning. It's a great play. It's going to be lots of fun with our kids. My son is in it. Don't want to miss him. He's a stud. My mom and dad are coming in. They'll be in town. So excited to see them. We're in the Christmas season. We're in a series about Christmas, getting set for what's coming up. And for some, this is the greatest time of the year. You love Christmas. You love decorating. Your Christmas decorations have already been out for three months. Others, you put your Christmas decorations up Christmas Eve and it's not really your thing. But for others, you know, like it can be like a stressful time, a lot of pressure. For me, it's kind of like both. I love seeing my son uh, enjoy the Christmas season and my, and my daughters enjoy the Christmas season. But like I get a lot of anxiety when it comes to buying gifts. Like, just give me a list. Make it simple. I'm not creative when it comes to that. I'm not like a real big gift giver. Let me know what you're expecting. I'll go buy it. I don't really care how much it is. But like the worst thing in the world is like you give somebody a gift, you're excited about it, they open it, and they're like, oh, well, thank you. And like no response, nothing, right? And so my hope is that this Christmas season we can find what the Bible says, peace on earth goodwill toward all men, we can love our neighbors, we can enjoy what God is doing in our lives. And as we begin to talk about Christmas, we start talking about the real reason for Christmas, not the Santa Claus that comes down the chimney, but Jesus Christ coming to this earth in the form of a child. We want to answer this question, why Jesus? Why did we need Jesus? Why did we need God himself, God eternal, to come to the earth at the time that he came. What is the real meaning of Christmas? Because we can often get caught up in the festivities and the traditions associated with this time of year. But it's, it's essential to understand the profound significance of Jesus' birth. I mean, it is so profound that our calendar is gauged based upon the life of Christ before Christ, right, before B.C., and that's where time and date kind of started for the calendar in which we uh, live by. So today we're going to journey through some scripture. We're going to examine why Jesus came to this earth and the impact that it has on us today. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you as we get into your word today that you would open the eyes of our understanding, enlighten us to your truth, show us things to come, speak to our hearts, bring us joy, bring us peace in Jesus' name. Amen. So has anybody ever been in a situation where you needed someone to rescue you? You needed someone to save you, help you out? Anybody at all? I'll say if you've never been in that situation, you're probably living life too safe. Um, many, many occasions. I could probably for all day tell stories about when I needed to scream out and have somebody come help me, come save me, come rescue me. But I'm going to tell one story today, one particular story. It has traumatized me, it has affected me, I'm still in counseling for it. One night in the middle of the night, I don't know what time it was, it was somewhere in the middle of the night, uh, I, I woke up because I had vomited in my sleep. And I'm a back sleeper particularly, so I just can imagine like I vomited and it came right back down in my face. And since I was sleeping, there was no control over that and I inhaled it, I aspirated into my lungs this vomit. And uh, yeah, um, it was kind of nasty. But I woke up and I couldn't breathe. Like I was literally like my lungs were on fire, I couldn't inhale, I couldn't exhale, I couldn't cough it out. And so, like, I dramatically threw myself out of bed, like, crawled to the bathroom. We have an adjoining bathroom to our bedroom. And I'm, like, like hanging over the toilet, trying to get this stuff out of my lungs, and it's just not happening. I'm trying to cough, but I can't. I feel like my lungs are paralyzed. And, I mean, all of that happened in about 20 seconds of time, but it was a whole situation. And so I'm pretty dramatic to begin with. So like I need help, but I can't scream, I can't breathe, I can't yell, I can't do anything. So I'm kicking the floor, I'm banging on the wall, I'm slamming the toilet seat. Nobody came to my rescue. 
Nobody. Mind you, one of my kids fart three rooms away, and my wife can hear that. Oh, the baby must have some gas. Right, like mom ears, they can hear everything. Let a child whimper and they're awake. But me, I'm thrashing in the bathroom, slamming against the wall, and no one woke up for me. Now, this is a serious situation. Like, I'm not even exaggerating. You can ask my wife, she'll tell you the whole, that I, I lie not. Um, it was so bad that I just kind of came to the point where I just knew I was going to die. So I had my head, I laid it on the toilet seat. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I prayed this prayer. Lord, into your hands I commit my spirit. <laughs> I gave up the ghost. I gave up. I'm going to die. No one there to save me. No one came to give me the Heimlich maneuver. I mean, I was like pushing my stomach against the toilet, everything to breathe. And so at some point I did pass out. I passed out, I blacked out, uh, laid out on the floor, uh, and then I don't know how long I was knocked out or whatever, but I came to, I, I woke up, obviously I'm still here, I didn't die, thought I died, climbed back into bed, and I wanted to punch my wife in the face so hard. <laughs> you know, one of those things, right, like she wouldn't know what happened, like, whoa, like, mm. I'm still mad about it today, I'm still upset. Because, like, I'm there to rescue everybody, right? There was no one there to rescue me. So that is a true story, very dramatic, traumatic for me. Like I said, I'm still in counseling. But all of, all of us need a savior in our lives. Maybe you have been in a situation like that. So one time I thought, I, you know, I don't like asking for help. Anybody like that? You don't like asking for help? I just try to do it by myself. In our old building, at our, at our old building downtown Middletown, we had a freezer that we needed to get down to the basement. And so I thought I could move this freezer to the basement by myself. Don't need any help, right? Got the hand truck. I got it all worked out. Something happened. I don't know exactly, but like the hand truck went. I went over the freezer. Freezer landed on me. Stuck under the freezer for like an hour. Help! <laughs> you know, I needed somebody to come rescue me. I couldn't lift that thing off me. I was stuck. Right? Now, if nothing like that has ever happened to you, like I said, you need to get out. You need to get outside, do some stuff, climb a tree, put your life in danger. It makes you appreciate God a little bit more. But we all need a Savior. At some point in our lives, we come to a point where we understand that we have been suffocated by the sin of the world, suffocated by issues around our lives, the presence of evil that surrounds us, which introduces us to the question or the answer, why Jesus? Why Jesus? So this morning we're going to look at a popular passage of Scripture. We're going to dissect it a little bit and go through it. Is that all right? In the book of Romans, which is in the New Testament, Romans chapter 5 and beginning in verse 12, it says this, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man. Anybody know what one man that was? Adam, Adam, sin, <laughs> sin didn't enter the world through Jesus. Sin entered the world through Adam. So just as sin entered the world through one man, Adam, and death through that sin, and in this way, death came to all people. Now that kind of stinks. I got to admit, that does stink. That we are guilty, not because of something that we personally did, but we're all guilty of the sin of the world because something Adam did. It's what scripture says, right? The fall of humanity, it was bestowed upon all man guilty of this sin because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, right? So watch this, verse 13. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. So let's look at that for a second. If there's a new road and there's no speed limit... You're not going to get a ticket for doing 55 because there's no speed limit posted. It doesn't have a speed limit. But the moment they put a sign up that says this road is 55 miles an hour, you go 80, they can enforce the law. There's now law. And when you break the law and law is enforced, there's a consequence to that law. So before there was law, it was not charged against people. Sin was there, but it was not charged against people's account. Verse 14, nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam 
to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as Adam did, who is a pattern of the one to come. So because of Adam's fall, his disobedience to God, sin entered the world, therefore death was passed on to all flesh because of Adam. And because of that, we all need a savior. We all need a savior. All humanity is guilty of the sin of the world because of the fall of Adam. And just like Adam, or just like the fall of man, just our need for a savior, when I was in the bathroom, on the floor, crying out, I couldn't help myself. I tried my heart to do the Heimlich maneuver and get that thing out, but there was nothing I could do in and of myself to save myself. I needed help, and we all need help. At some point in our lives, we've tried to do things certain ways, live a certain lifestyle, go on a diet, go on Atkins diet. Atkins diet is just torture. It's just torture. You're setting yourself up for failure with no carbohydrates. And it's just hard. I'm not, I, I'm not even going to go into diets. But I'm just saying, like we've all like made that, like I'm going to do this diet. And you're good for like two weeks until all the sugar's out of your system. And then you start bugging out and acting all crazy. You got bipolar disorder and split personality and all that. And come to find out it was just sugar. <laughs> we need a savior, man. Check this out, Ephesians 2.8. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. Here's the point that I want to look at. And it is not from yourself. You've been saved by grace, not by yourself. And so there's this ideology in society like, when you die, where are you going to go? Well, I'm going to go to heaven. Well, how do you know? Because I'm a good person. Mm, that, that's a tricky one. Like, I'm really glad that you're a good person. But your good deeds and you being a good person is not enough to undo the sin of humanity. Your ability to behave, your ability to follow the law is not enough to inherit eternal life through Jesus Christ. It's, it's not enough. You can't do it. You can't be good enough to access that. That's why this is a free gift from Jesus Christ. And that's the great part about it. Every single one of us has to come to a point where we understand and realize, I can't save myself. I can't save myself. I can't do enough to be saved by God. You can't obtain salvation or forgiveness of sin by your own merit. If I could have given myself the Heimlich maneuver, I would have. If I could have got that stuff out of my lungs, I would have. But I, in that moment, was powerless to save myself on that dark, cold floor in my bathroom. Couldn't do it, man. I could still relive it. I could still taste the vomit. <laughs> we all need a savior. And that is found in Jesus. And here's what I love about the Bible. The Bible does point out the problem. It points out the problems. And, and, I, and I love the fact that the Bible didn't take out the problems and mistakes in the stories of other people in the Bible. Like it didn't take out all of David's mistakes. Of the Bible. We got to see his mistakes. We get to see those problems. But what I love about the Bible is that it always gives us an answer. It always gives us a solution to the problem. So we've got to finish the verse, right? We've got to finish the thought, the context of Romans 5. And so it goes into this in Romans 5, 15. But the gift is not like the trespass. So the free gift of God is not like the sin of Adam. For if, by, for if many died by the sin of Adam by one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to many? And I love that. It overflowed to many. By one man, sin entered the world and death by sin, so all have sinned. By another man, one other man, Jesus Christ, the grace of God came, the free gift of eternal life that overflows to many, to all people who would believe. Verse 16, nor can the gift of God be compared with the results of one man's sin. He's saying, 
the grace of God and the gift of Jesus Christ is so much bigger that if you try to compare it to the sin of Adam, they're not even in the same league. And there's a problem that I find in churches. Churches glorify sin over the finished work of Jesus Christ. They almost preach as if the power of sin is stronger than salvation. As if, as if God would give his son to die on the cross for all humankind, humankind and we could somehow mess that up. That's a, that, that's a dumb idea. That's a dumb design. That if my behavior and my sin could undo my salvation, then I guess it wasn't a finished work. Now, you think I'm being a heretic, just go back and read your Bible. Look what it says here. The gift of God cannot be compared to the result of man's sin. It's far greater. It's far greater. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. And I love that word justification. The word justification is the word justified. The word justified, if you want to break it down to simple ideology, is justified never sinned. Just if I'd never sinned. I'm in a state, I'm in a position, justified never sinned. Just if I had never sinned. So let me equate it to this. Um, I was not a good dad when it came to babies. I thought I would have been a much better dad to babies. Uh, my own babies, I say that. Um, but I realized with my first child that I have a very strong gag reflex. Gag reflex. And so, um, yeah, trying to change a dirty diaper didn't bode well for me. It was a bad situation. I think, honestly, with three kids, I think that I have changed three number two diapers. Sorry, I, I can't do it. I can't do it. It's not in me. Some of you dads, you're so much better than me. You're so much better than me. And if I did have to change a dirty diaper, this is how it went down. We kind of just dropped that thing off. You're in the bathtub. I turned the pressure washer on. I ain't touching that. Like, I can't, I can't get that close. It's bad. But then once it's all cleaned up, that nastiness is taken care of. You got the Johnson Johnson lotion on the baby, the baby oil in the hair. Man, it's just if they'd never messed up. Right? I was a great dad to clean babies. I'd, I'd do that all day. Like take naps and hold you and give you a bottle, all that. But like the dirty stuff I couldn't handle. And sometimes we think God's the same way. We think God can't handle our dirtiness. We think God can't handle our mess. And we think that God says the same thing, like go clean up and then you can come back and be near me. But he created this plan of salvation in a way that we're forever clean in his eyes. We are forever clean in his eyes. That's what justification is. He sees us justified had never sinned. Just if the sin of the world had never happened among his children. Verse 17, for if by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in this life through the one man, Jesus Christ. That is good news. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for, say it with me, all people. Not just the Israelites. Not just the Jews. This is saying also to the Gentile world. Those outside of the bloodline, outside of the pedigree, outside of the house of David. Salvation, justification, righteousness is available to all people that call upon the name of the Lord. So point number one, if you're taking notes, Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. Jesus Christ is the Savior of all people. All people, not just his people. Not just his group, not just his nationality, not just his skin color. All 
people. Jesus' birth was not merely a historical event. It was a divine intervention that forever changed the course of humanity. His life, his death, and resurrection were all part of God's redemptive plan to rescue us from the power of sin and offer us the hope of salvation. He willingly took our sins upon his body on the tree, bearing the weight of our transgressions on the cross so that we might be set free. And so I'm going to tell you today that if you feel burdened by life, if you feel burdened by guilt, if you feel burdened by your past, that is not God. That is not God. Jesus took all that. He took all those things. He said, cast your cares on me. I care for you. The Bible says his yoke is easy. His burden is light. So if you're feeling heavy and weighed down, you're carrying the wrong baggage. You're carrying things from the voice of the accuser of the brethren, which is the enemy. That is not God reminding you of how bad you are. The righteousness of God, God wants to remind you of who you are in him. So here's what I know. Here's what I know. Jesus provides a love that knows no bounds. Jesus provides a love that knows no bounds. And that's hard for many of us to accept. Because every single one of us in here have a level of love that is based upon situation. I love you if you love me. I love you as long as you're faithful to me. I love you as long as you're nice to me. If you ever do this, I'll stab you with a cuchillo. I'll cut you. Don't you ever, that knife. Don't you ever do this, right? right well, we set these things up. We set all these things. I love you, but. And there's nothing like that in God. God doesn't say that to us. God doesn't have that agenda. He actually acted to prove his love. For God so loved the world that before he bragged about his love, he sent his son. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. He gave before he even said. Man, most of us, we, we say a whole lot and we don't ever back it with our actions. He backed everything he did with, said with his actions. When we accept Jesus Christ into our lives, we experience the limitless love and forgiveness he offers. His love is unconditional, it's unshakable, it's unending. It transforms our hearts and empowers us to love others selflessly and reflect his character in all that we do. We are empowered to do that. Now, do we all do it? No. No, we don't. We don't all love our neighbors. We don't all love everyone around us. We... The, man, the Bible even says, love your enemies. Do good to those who curse you and spitefully use you. Are you kidding me? Like, that's so hard to do today, right? But that is the ability that we have in Christ. Now, working out our own salvation, that's a different story, right? That's a process. That's something that we have to do. Here's also what I know about Jesus. He is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. He is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. Jesus is not only the Savior who offers eternal life, but also the guide in our earthly journey. The Bible said, Jesus said, I must go away so that I can send another. What did he do? He sent his spirit to be our guide, to be our ever-present help in time of need, to be our comforter, our counselor, to bring us joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness. All of these things came up through the life of Christ by the Spirit. He provides purpose, truth, and meaning to our existence. I hope you have a meaning for your life. I, I hope you have a, a vision statement for your life. What are you supposed to do? What are you supposed to accomplish in your lifetime? Because God has a plan for you. Through Jesus' teachings, he shows us how to live a life that brings glory to God and bless those around us. So as we celebrate the birth of Jesus this Christmas season, I want us to rem remember why he came. Why did he come to the earth? And it's a four-letter word. 
Sorry to tell you. I know we're not supposed to say four-letter words in church, but we're going to say this one. Jesus came at just the right time because of love. Because of love. Because of love. Because of love. And so, like, that's kind of why I set us up last week with communion and asking God, do you love me? Because until you understand the depths of God's love for you specifically, it can be very difficult to live the Christian life. If you think God is angry at you, if you think God is mad at you, if you think God is disappointed with you, you don't have a great relationship. Just think about your mom and dad when you thought your mom and dad were mad at you. You didn't want to go hang out with them. If you thought that they were getting ready to give you a bow bow, like you weren't best friends. And when you know that someone is looking to punish you or, or spank you or discipline you, you avoid them. You don't go share secrets. You hide. You sneak. Right? And so the same idea falls to our relationship with God. If you think that God is this angry old man sitting in heaven waiting to get you, you're not going to go talk to him about problems. You're going to hide and sneak and try to get, get away with stuff. That's not the God that we serve. That's not the design of heaven. Jesus came at just the right time because of love. His birth heralded the dawn of hope, the fulfillment of God's promise, and the birth of a new possibility for all who would believe in him. He invites us to have a personal relationship with him, to experience his transforming power, and to choose the path of eternal life. Unlike my wife's love for me, that depends on sleep, and her lack of awareness that I'm dying in the bathroom, God's love never fails. That was a joke. My wife loves me. We all good? I thought that, I thought that would have been funnier. God's love never fails. Even though my family completely abandoned me when I needed them the most, I believe that Jesus saved me on the bathroom floor that night. And I'm not trying to be weird, right? I'm not trying to be weird and make something up, but... I just, I like to make stuff up to give me hope. Is that all right? And that's kind of what faith is, right? So what I think happened was I was going to die that night. I do. I pass out on the floor. And I believe that Jesus showed up. Holy Spirit, whatever, however you want to say it. I believe Jesus showed up for me. And I believe that he did CPR on me. And so I got a little revelation of it. I, I believe that CPR stands for Christ's personal response. Christ's personal response. He met me where I was at the moment I needed. He responded to me personally to rescue me and save me when no one else could or would. Christ was there. And this is what I love about the grace of God. The grace of God is not a license to sin. The grace of God is not a license to live a lascivious life. That's not at all what it was. The grace of God is a safety protocol put in place that Christians, when they mess up, would not have to experience the sting of death. And when I mean death, I'm talking about spiritual death. So has anybody gone rock climbing, like real rock climbing? Brett, you ain't never right. <laughs> when I was in college, um, uh, I was in Oklahoma, and there would be these rock formations that we would go climb. And when we started out, we would just go climb them, like free form climbing. But when you're free form climbing, like you're very, very intentional about where your footholds are and your handholds are because if you slip and fall, it's gonna hurt, it's gonna hurt. Now, free flip form climbing, I only went maybe 20 feet up. I wasn't gonna climb too high because I was learning, I was inexperienced. And these guys were like, yo, let's do like 100 foot. Let's do 150 foot. I'm like, bro, you're crazy, like I'm gonna die. It's like, all right, so now they introduced harnesses and ropes to us. 
to put a harness on, you put a rope up to the top of the hill to a pulley, back down to a tree that has a pulley, and then you got a spotter behind you, right? So you put the harness on, you get ready, you say, belay on, or on belay, and they say, belay on, which means go ahead and climb. And so now you start climbing. And now there's like a freedom. I can like have fun with this. I can try different holds and, and jump to different crevices without fear of dying. It was not my intention to fall off the mountain. It was my intention to conquer it. I'm going to go for it. I'm going to go at it with all diligence and I'm going to work for it. But if at some point along the journey of the climb I slip and fall, the consequence of that is not death. The consequence is that I'm caught by a rope. And that's the grace of God. That's the grace of God. It is not our intention to go and sin and to live a horrible life. Our intention is to honor God in what we do. But along that journey, if I make a mistake, if someone cuts me off on the highway and they catch the finger, <laughs> I don't do that. But I'm just saying, I've seen some of you do that. Some of you gave me the finger on the highway. I don't <laughs> After you ask for forgiveness, like the, 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 the purpose, it's to, the, the Bible says this, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, right? That's my goal. That's what I'm climbing towards. But I'm not going to do it perfect. There are going to be times that I'm going to mess up. There are going to be times that I get angry. There going to be times that I make a mistake. I say the wrong thing, Right? And that's when the belay kicks in, man. That's when that rope kicks in. I'm saved. I'm rescued by what Jesus Christ already did in my life. That's the work of the cross. That's why we needed a Savior. During this season, I pray that we would reflect upon the true reason behind our celebration. It's not celebrating a man that looks a lot like me, big belly, white beard, that comes down a chimney. The real reason for the holiday is Jesus Christ, the anointed one and his anointing, the savior of the world, the Messiah, Yeshua Christ, who came into this world to save us at just the right time. As we go forth, let us share the good news of Jesus' birth by emulating his love. The Bible says that you will be known as my disciples by the way that you love others. We have to show love. We have to show love. Even if that person grabs the last TV off the shelf that you were going to buy, we got to show them love. Jesus' compassion, his sacrifice, may it prepare your hearts and your homes to bring peace and joy in this holiday season. I was in a, an amazing leadership Zoom call this week. And this guy was talking about uh, leaders and, and, and people who are world changers and very productive in life. And he says, I don't see burnout as being the biggest, call, the biggest tragedy in people's lives today. He said, I know that burnout's a buzzword. He goes, the biggest tragedy in people's lives today is that they're productive, but they have no joy. They're producing things, they're successful, but they're not happy doing it. They're not full of joy doing it. They, they have achieved a certain level of success and they've got the house that they want and they still don't have joy. See, joy isn't found in circumstance. Joy is found in the Lord, right? It is the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is our strength. A merry heart or a joy-filled heart does good like a medicine. My prayer is that we would find joy, that, that over this holiday season, that you would have moments and opportunities with family and friends that you have deep belly laughs. Deep belly laughs where you can barely catch your breath. Like, when's the last time you laughed like that? That's what we need in our lives, not more seriousness more drama, 
but the joy that comes in knowing Christ. And maybe you're watching online or you're in the room today and you don't know that joy because you don't know the Christ of the joy. The joy of the Lord only comes if you know the Lord. And so we want to invite you into that today. And here at Family Church, the Bible says that it is with the heart that man believes, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So if you've never accepted Christ by a belief or with a prayer, we'd love to invite you into that today. And because we love you, we all say it together. And it goes like this, dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor John Mark, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. We want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is to take your next step in your journey. We'd love to help you do that, and you can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.